Let's now talk about a barrier, meaning that your incoming particle is coming from a region where V equals zero, and then it gets to a positive V. Now there's two different scenarios to think about. One is where your energy is way up here, right? So if you have this energy, this corresponds to our free particle. This is now going to be similar to our situation before with the well. So this is a scattering scenario. You have a wave coming in, you have a wave reflecting back, you have a wave going to the right here, to the left there, and a wave going out. That's how you would mathematically set it up. So very similar to before. We can sketch what that's going to look like. Again, this is part of the value of what we did in the last chapter of trying to actually just qualitatively sketch what's going to happen. So I'm going to have a certain wavelength and amplitude out here. Now, I'm not very good at drawing. And the key is whatever point you get to here is OK. You don't necessarily need to be at a, at a node or an antinode when you get here. But now, your first derivative in your wave function has to be continuous. And we could say what's going to happen to our amplitude and what's going to happen to our wavelength, which theoretically has been constant here, even though I suck at drawing it. So right now, this gap is smaller. So that's like saying you're closer to the bottom of the well. Here's one way to think through that. That means your wavelength will be longer. Is your amplitude are going to be larger or smaller? This is where it's a little counterintuitive. If your kinetic energy here, again, going back to a classical analog, if your kinetic energy here is smaller, well, then it's going slower and it spends more time here. So the wavelength needs to get longer and your amplitude needs to get bigger. And then it goes back to what it was before. So your wavelength and amplitude, your wavelength here needs to be the same as the wavelength there. Mathematically, you're going to have that effectively that e to the i k one x e to the negative a i k one x with different coefficients here, and then e to the i k two e to the negative i k two x, which we're adding together here, and then back to e to the i k one x, and each of those would have different coefficients. So we can sketch what that's going to look like, and the magnitude here shouldn't be, shouldn't be bigger, right? We shouldn't end up with more transmitted. So if I've drawn it about the same, that's not great. Let me go back and try to make this a little bit better. It should, it should be smaller. Again, because some of it has been, eh, maybe, right? Some of it has been transmitted, but not all of that. Now let's think about the scenario here, where now, it is below the well. Classically, the answer is your particle gets here and bounces off. That's not the situation here. So don't worry too much about how I draw the relative amplitude or wavelength between this one and this one. I'm not that good at drawing. So I have some wave that is coming in, and it gets here. It now is getting to the forbidden region. What does your wave function do? Well, it exponentially decays. Now normally, when we had a finite well, it exponentially decayed to zero. Is that what's going to happen here? No. Right? An exponential function only hits zero when you hit infinity. It doesn't go to infinity. So it does, in fact, and you know, my drawing isn't great, it does, in fact, decay. Right? Decay, decay, decay. Then it gets here. Well, what happens? It's sinusoidal again. Now remember, the wave function in that first derivative needs to be constant, and so, again, is the wavelength here the same as the wavelength there? Yes, it should be. Haven't drawn it that way. Drawing's hard. So let me try to fix that. You can see why I don't normally erase on screen. Okay, so let me try to fix, okay, eh, better maybe. <laughs> again, that's supposed to be sinusoidal. So something to think about is that again here, we would have our e i to the k 1 x. Now it's technically a different k because we have a different e, but the, re the relationship is this still the same. And then we have that backwards traveling. So again, part of it is reflected, and part of it travels forwards. And then in here, we have e. Now, 
There's different ways to write this. I'm going to call this negative qx. Right? So remember that, that q is then kind of the same thing, but the sign is flipped. Or at least we don't have a, a... If you set it up the same way, you would get a minus sign, but we don't have to worry about that. So, okay, exponential decay. But here's, here's the weird thing. Remember that when we solved the... When we solved the differential equation before, we got both terms. And I said, I got to throw this one away because I know it's not going to become infinity at x equals infinity. Both of them contribute here, actually. Now, you don't expect it to actually like, come back up, but you are adding the two of these together. And the reason you're adding the two of them together is that's your solution, and you don't have a boundary condition to actually exclude this one. So again, there's different coefficients here, there's different coefficients here, you'd actually have to do the math to solve it. And then over here, we're back to that rightward traveling wave with again the same k1 as before because our energies are the same. If you had a situation where now this was a higher level, this would be like k2, it would be a different value. So I hope that this makes sense. Again, the key is to recognize that you have a lot more free parameters now and the constraints on those free parameters are coming from the boundary conditions where that's really saying your wave function on the left and the right have to be equal because your potential is finite. Your derivative on the left and the right has to be equal. So there's just a whole lot of math then, some, a little bit of calculus, mostly some algebra to come up with what those constraints are. There are some equations in the book in terms of the reflection and transmission probabilities that have kind of been derived, because you can derive this in general then, rather than for um, specific conditions. Um, but do keep track of what those are for. So again, there's different scenarios, whether you have a boundary, if you have the initial and the final height different, then that's, that's not the same. So I hope that this has made um, some sense. Again, that practice of really saying, what is my initial condition, com what is my initial general equation coming from the uh, Schrodinger equation, coming from that differential equation? And then what are the boundary conditions that actually constrain those parameters? So hope this has made it more clear. Again, remember now that you don't have a quantization of energy that was coming actually from your boundary conditions in the wells, that now for these free particle states, you don't actually have that.